got Lauren Sager Weinstein, the Chief Data Officer of uh, Transport for London. We've got George Johnson, founder of Nitrous and Taxi Ventures, and Emily Brooke, the founder of Beryl, a smart mobility startup. Now, Lauren, I'd like to start with you. Um, your Chief Data Officer, obviously, of the Transport of London. It's a big job. I'm interested in your job title, because I can imagine every dinner party, as soon as people find out your Chief Data Officer for Transport of London, they start complaining about their commute. But like, could you just explain a little bit for the, for the audience like, what your job really entails? So we get all sorts of system uh, data that comes, on, comes out of all the, when we're running our transport services. And you know, if the data that's coming out is just data. My job is to work with my teams to make it useful so that we can understand the patterns and, the, and give this information back to our customers so that you all know how the transport network is running and can take action on that. And then how we can feed that back into our operational plans to give it to our controllers in our sort of network operation centers to feed it into models when we're thinking about the future and thinking about the future um, of even more urbanization. How do we cope with that? How do we prepare? And this is where my job is to sort of orchestrate and try to build that sort of world where we can use data to take action. Okay. I moved to London about just under 15 years ago, and I think you just, uh, well, TFL had just launched the Oyster program, and I thought that was like something out of Star Trek. That was totally amazing. Just flash a card, bang, straight through. It was amazing. And now I see everyone using their smartphone. So can you give, give us some idea about the changes that you've seen over the past 15 years, or even the past in your career, of how uh, organizations like TFL have collected that data and how they use it? Well, it's interesting because when I started, so I've actually been at TFL for 17 years, and, and a chief data officer role didn't exist. right? So I came in and I worked on sort of how do we sort of think about the business strategy and direction. But I was always pulled into technology. And so what um, I ended up doing is working on our smart card, on Oyster and the ticketing system. And it, there was this great opportunity where we said, OK, we know Oyster is uh, very successful. Um, first of all, you know, what, do, how, what do we think about for tomorrow? And this is where the thinking about how do you create sort of contactless payment on the tube network and across sort of London. And it just was born from this thinking about how do you evolve um, with technology. And then there was this side project, right? So it was like, well, there's this really interesting data that's coming out, pattern data from the uh, ticketing system. Could we do something with this? And this is where we began to look for patterns in the, in the network um, and see whether we could um, replace these paper surveys that we were handing out to our uh, people traveling through our stations. We'd hand, we pick one station every five years, hand out a paper survey, and say, tell us where you traveled from and to. Now, it was very clear. Um, even back then when we started, that there's got to be a better way to do this. And this is where the sort of the data and the ability to process data um, and sort of make sense out of it, that's where we sort of began to see that sort of big change. And we've just evolved from there. Okay. Um, Emily, I'd just like to move to you now. I mean, you founded Beryl, um, which I think started off as a, as a bike accessories, essentially, startup. Uh, but and obviously, it's now a lot more than that. Could you just give me a few examples for the audience about the products that, um, that you're making now? And then we can dive into the Internet of Things. Yeah, sure. Um, can you hear me? My microphone? Uh, it's Emily Brooke, not Brown. Um, so we create technology for cyclists. Our first product is called the Laser Light, which tackles the blind spot. It's a front light that also has a green laser that projects the symbol of a bike ahead of you onto the road, which starts off as my university project. It's now on all the Santander cycles in London. Um, we then co-designed the new Santander cycle and provided lights, laser, GPS, Bluetooth sensors, all the connectivity for the bikes. Um, and then now we're launching our own bike share. So, end of this week, actually, we've got our own barrel bikes rolling out on the streets of Bournemouth and London and Hereford. Um, it's all app-based, so you rent a bike through the app, but it's a really high-quality bike. It's 20% uh, lighter than a Santander cycle, and it's parked in a bay. So, you've got geo-fenced uh, locations where the bikes are left. So, cities like it, the bikes aren't left everywhere, and users like it because they know where they can find the bikes. Have you made them 20% lighter? Like, what have you... Well, you've added more, obviously, than Santander, I think, but it's what have not, you taken away? a lot more technology on board. Um, it's just a, a better, better frame. It's much more nimble and lighter. Uh, the wheels are 24 inch wheels. It fits somebody from 4 foot 11 up to 6 foot 5. Um, and it's our barrel green. So they're quite iconic uh, on the streets. Why have you called it barrel? So we were called Blaze originally. Uh, barrel actually, we had to rename it because of a trademark issue in the States. And Beryl, uh, Beryl Burton was a, was a female cyclist in the 60s and 70s who dominated British cycling and won, I think, 70 domestic championships and seven world championship medals and set the men's time trial record for Twy Vowels, uh, which she held for two years. She's a complete hero. Um, and a barrel is also an emerald. It's that green, that green laser you see on the streets of London and New York. 
is, is, is um, emerald green. So. Do you want to just quickly touch on some of the technology that these bikes have that normal like bike sharing doesn't have, for example? Yeah. So all of our technology, critically, is on the bike rather than in the mobile phone. Lots of other providers require you to fall over a bike and pair by Bluetooth, and then they know where the bike is, whereas ours has basically a brain built into the bike, and it's always connected and it's always live, um, which means we have accurate GPS, accurate connectivity, which means we can do these accurate geofenced bays. We know to the nearest three metres where each bike is without touching the user's mobile phone or their data at all. Okay. Now, just lastly on that point, obviously the bike technology is amazing but creating a business is also incredibly hard so and i don't want to obviously you to 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 say too many nasty things maybe about tfl obviously but what have you found is the biggest obstacle in getting cities like excited about your technology because you're launching in bournemouth i think on friday right and so how have you done that we're launching in bournemouth um my microphone keeps going on uh we've got a thousand bikes going out over the summer in bournemouth london we're launching in the city of london the center of london um, and four boroughs in northeast london and hereford i think our our biggest challenge is lots of the other providers are talking about doing things like working with local authorities, working with cities, providing their data, um, accurate bay parking, all of these things, but actually trying to communicate why our offering is different and actually that we are doing these things properly um, before you go live is a real challenge. Um, and well, it's all to be proved, so we'll get the bikes out on the street next week and, and, we'll, we'll, and it's, we feel like we have all the ingredients for for the, for, the, for the service, but until it's actually out there on the street, you can't taste the pudding until it's cooked. Well, good luck. Hope it goes well. Um, George, I'd like to move to you. Um, obviously, you help companies like uh, Emily's work with governments and local authorities and, and, and boroughs. Do you want to give a brief uh, like intro about and what you do, um, and then we can, then we can move from there? Yep. Uh, okay, good. So uh, we are trying to unlock that £50 billion pound UK public sector procurement opportunity for all the great SMEs out there, including Beryl, of course. Uh, they uh, don't get excited by that. I see lots of faces in the room that are like, wow, that's a big number. I want a piece of that pie. But actually, um, startups don't, because, uh, particularly because they're investors. They feel like it's uh, a very long-term model, a long-term vision to try and get into the public sector and provide solutions that can really make an impact to all of us. So uh, we feel like it's time for change. We're trying to build technology, solutions, and of course networks that can encourage SMEs to have better opportunities with government, whether that's through the procurement frameworks and how they change, whether that's looking at making procurement data more transparent and accessible for SMEs to focus on the best opportunities, um, or whether it's about reframing how SMEs actually approach government in the first place and working with their investors um, as well as some of their customers to build the right case studies that make it seem like a real opportunity. I think following the Uber IPO, um, all the Uber execs have now chosen to come out and talk about um, how ashamed they was with uh, how they dealt with cities and the relationships they built with cities and how much that has affected them as a business. So I think that this is a really good time now to open up that opportunity. Okay. I mean, you're, I think a good example is you're working with the German manufacturer Bosch and, and, and TfL as well, and they're teaming them up to, to, to work out new ways of making cities smarter, and you've helped organise this project, I think. And that helped me understand, though, why connecting the company that makes my power drill with one of the most, world's most complicated cities is like a big selling point. Like, what am I, what am I missing? <laughs> so, you know, when Bosch first approached me, uh, I thought the same thing. I thought, are we going to be reinvented the kitchen? Uh, are we going to be uh, creating the new microwave of the future? But actually, uh, Bosch's business, 60% of it is mobility. So every, uh, so 95% of cars in the UK have at least one Bosch component within it, or one Bosch semiconductor through to machine parts um, piece. And that just goes to show um, the relationship they have with OEMs. Uh, so the Fords of the world, the Jaguar Land Rovers, and that really excited us because these guys obviously have great channel to market. They have such a great opportunity as well to already be out there collecting the necessary data that we need um, to build new solutions. So it made so much sense when Bosch um, was approaching and talking to TfL that we wanted support in helping that partnership be a success. So our role is very much uh, helping Bosch and TfL access some of the solutions, um, just like Beryl, that can help form part of these new um, mobility solutions that are being developed, and, which is, and what's very exciting. Um, so I think Theo Blackwell, I think, was supposed to be on the panel tonight, but he, um, of course, led the London Civic Challenges, which, of course, TfL then focuses heavily 
of course, the mobility challenges which London has, how can we focus specifically on them, those challenge statements that already exist, to provide the right solutions using the available data um, uh, going forward? So I think it's very exciting. Yeah. Do you have any evidence, though, of that IoT startups are part of the solution when trying to solve the big problems that we spoke about that the cities have? Because it's one thing for a large company with a lot of resources to come in, but if, if George or Lauren, do you want to talk about how startups, you think, can help solve this problem as well? I would just take a step back and say, you know, what is our challenge? So, so why, am I, why am I here? Why do I do the work that I want to do? I want to understand and support sort of London as a city and how does London work. And there's a lot of data that I have to hand in the public transport network, um, and we use that. But you know, we have to understand the sort of all the patterns of how sort of the city as a whole works together. And this is where there's a real opportunity to work in partnership. Um, and so I am very excited about sort of the opportunities to sort of look at different data sets, data sets as well as to bring in new thinking. So how do you get new ideas coming in from people who have a different perspective? And so that's where I think the real win is here. So, um, and this is where I think it's great to try lots of different new things. It's, it's experimenting. It's testing things out. Um, the only caution, I would say, is that there's a risk. You can get very carried away in things that are kind of fun and exciting, um, and it's easy for us all to sort of get sort of distracted by it. So what we have to do is really focus it on the business question at hand. So as, as you said, it's what's, the, what's the challenge we're trying to solve? What's the, what, are, what, are we, what action would we take? How would we sort of change the way we have our infrastructure um, or our services? How would we sort of change sort of public services as well, mobility services? And where can then data help us identify and take action? And if we focus on that, um, there's a huge opportunity. That's interesting. I mean, how much of it is, is you've got to be careful because you have so much data now. It's incredible. But how much of it is just an intellectual exercise? And how do you take it from being an intellectual exercise and applying it to something that's going to make all our lives better? I mean, what's the difficulty there? Well, so I think, I mean, I think that's the challenge, right? And so that's where you have to be very clear about what you're going to do. So you know, we, I will give a couple of examples on the public transport um, sort of network side that we've been working on. Um, you know, so one of them has been how do we understand sort of bus patterns and bus occupancy um, to make sure that we're running the network that is um, sort of responsive and and is efficient for London, and this is where you know again we could sort of we could sort of say okay what's you know throw all the data at it, but this is where we sort of had a specific question, and that's where we began to take sort of data from the ticketing system and telematic data from our buses to understand um, where the sort of the network is, and we feed that back into sort of bus network planning and our operations um, of our metrics of how our buses are doing, and that's something we've been doing for years. But then we sort of have have thoughts about what else can we do, um, and this is where we've sort of then taken you know, large data sets um, that otherwise have sort of sat on the side. And then when you have a business case and a sort of a, a, a challenge of doing something different, we started to look at that. And so one of the areas that we're beginning to look at now is sort of identifying where they're sort of speeding, um, where buses may be going too quickly at different times, and identifying those buses and going back to bus, uh, bus garages and bus drivers to say, you know, we've identified in the telematic data that this is, a, uh, this is speeding. We, you need to, to sort of... A, address this. And that is something where you know, it comes out of this really huge, messy file, um, all these log, log files that were sitting there. And when we had a business case and an application, we sort of, we sort of set to work at, at using that. The sort of challenges of changing people's minds, because you know what it's like whenever someone tells you you're speeding, you laugh and think, of course I'm not, I'm driving incredibly safely, because you have a, a, you know, a disproportionate sense of how good you are as a driver, and I bet bus drivers are probably worse than perhaps you other know, drivers. We, we have a vision zero target, right? We want to eliminate um, sort of deaths and injuries on the road. Um, and we want to make sure that we're sort of making our buses safe. We want to make sure that we don't have pedestrian accidents, cycling accidents, and driving accidents. And it is a very big priority for us. And you know, that's where, again, if you have a strategic goal, um, and it's a very important one, that's where you sort of, sort of start looking at the data that you have to identify any way that you can sort of address it. There is technology solutions in, that we'll be bringing in to control the speeds themselves. But before you even can sort of bring in the sort of physical technology, to, uh, fitting it on the buses, we can begin to identify things um, right now from the data we have. Okay, that's interesting. But just taking that thought as well on the practical applications, Emily, um, I'd like to talk about pollution um, for a little bit. Um, obviously, it's a topic that many mayors like to uh, have opinions and opine about, and obviously it's incredibly important, especially in London. Um, I haven't seen a huge change over the past 10 years, but that doesn't mean there hasn't been a huge change. It might just mean I'm working somewhere slightly nicer. But why aren't we seeing, like, 
or when are we going to see a lot more IoT devices help use their data to improve pollution? I think bikes is obviously quite a good way of perhaps doing that. If you could talk a little bit about that, it would be interesting. Yeah, we'd love to do that. Um, and in fact, Laura and I were just talking in the green room just now. The, the new bike the technology we put on board has got GPS, for example. The, the bikes at the moment, they know they've left Hyde Park Corner and gone back to Hyde Park Corner. They have no idea where they've gone in the meantime. Um, and with GPS on board the bikes, we can see very accurately where the bikes have travelled. Um, but we've got a lot more other sensors on board the bikes. We've got pollution, pollution sensors, uh, temperature sensors, atmospheric accelerometer, um, all sorts of other things. And we can therefore build quite an accurate map of London. Um, Google actually just won some funding, which we went for, to do it with their Google Street cars, because uh, we would have loved to do it with the bikes, but it's still very possible. Um, at the moment, you've got very fixed space uh, stations in London, eight of them through one of the universities, that do atmospheric sensing and do very, um, you need them to calibrate the data, but with a fleet of bikes, you could also use that for actual mobile data sensing for pollution. I think it's obviously a great outcome, but there's always that initial feeling as a, as a user when you say, I've got all these sensors on this bike, we're going to be taking all this data. My immediate thought is, no, wait a minute, it's my data, because this is my ride. I mean, I know it's technically your bike, but I'm thinking, no, I'm, I'm the one using this, this, this form of transport. How are, you, how are you selling that to people? And, and also, how are you managing the privacy? Maybe we can privacy later, but let's talk about how you sell that idea about we can use your data for a benefit rather than use the data to sell you something. So we take our data really, really seriously. So we're just qualified as um, ISO 27001, which is will be the only micro-mobility company that's received that validation, which means that we've got really stringent data protection rules and, and protocols in place. Um, but critically, the big thing, the difference between us and everybody else is we don't touch the user's data. So we're tracking the asset. We'd like you track a bus or, a, or um, another form of, of a vehicle. It is a bike that's being tracked, not the individual. Um, so it's, we're not touching any, any of the mobile data at all. Um, actually, on that topic about, about privacy and maybe perhaps the, the misuse of data, George, I want to ask you, I mean, it's kind of taken for granted, and we've said lots of things already in this panel discussion about how technology and IoT can improve cities, but I'm interested in your thoughts about what are the, what are the major risks of believing too blindly about how technology can improve uh, the city infrastructure? Um, yeah, so I think from a private sector perspective, I think um, entrepreneurs and innovators for a long time have been doing what they do best, and that's come in and be disruptive. It's let's create a solution which is going to get market share, we're going to blitz scale it, and it's going to create something fantastic. And I think for a long time that's worked in mad tech, you know, media and advertising technologies, fintech, financial services, for example. <laughs> I don't mean to be rude, but can we just quiet down just a, just a little bit? We've only got a few more minutes of the, of the panel, and then we can carry on talking and drinking. But, uh, but yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, this, this for a, a very long time has been the nature of startups. But, of course, now when we have the commoditization of tools and technologies and IoT and general assembly courses, um, you know, it's great to see that new entrepreneurs are now tackling very big and important issues for our society, and this includes everything from health through to mobility through to energy. However, these sectors are ones which, of course, have very high impact, and you can't really disrupt. And I think when you hear startups talking about disruption in the public sector, I think for all parties involved, it's quite a scary thing. Um, so this constructive approach, rather, if we think about how you actually utilize um, collaboration. Now, collaboration, again, is a huge buzzword, but it's really, 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 really hard. It is really, really hard, but it is worth it. It's completely worth it. So I, I think, coming back to your, your point, I think, yes, startups play a role in this, but it's how they play a role alongside the city, alongside industry. We, we call this model co-creation, and co-creation, of course, has all of the same human issues of who gets the IP, who gets the data, who shares the, the, the risks and the rewards. But if you can make it work, it's one of the most effective models. So I think that's, that's something that is a better way of doing it. Um, the other issue, of course, is um, getting out of this idea of smart city. Um, I mean, I think you know, you'll agree, but everyone's trying to reinvent this word now because we're shying away from it, where uh, for a long time, large technology companies have considered city opportunities as top-down mass adoption. Um, and, of course, that's really not the case if you've actually spoken to local councils, particularly in London, and the way that they are disparate, but, of course, in many cities around the world. So, and, of course, the challenge with that is when you do that, it can only work in very closed environments because... 
a city is an organic beast with many different parts and IoT devices. And coming back to the IoT question here, the interoperability and how all of these things work together to actually create the solution, um, that's the problem we have. Um, so I, I think there's some of the issues, I think, with those top-down approaches. Yeah. What are the issues that we, you said collaboration is obviously the hardest thing. Is it, is it because there are so many actors? Is it because people think their technology is better than others? Like, why, why is it so difficult? I think it's a lack of case studies and lack of frameworks, um, lack of uh, standardization, um, opportunities particularly around data, um, IoT interoperability, um, like the Department for Culture, Media and Sport has only got as far as putting forward a specification for consumer grade IoT and not yet considered public sector or com uh, commercial IoT applications. So I think there's some limitations to actually making different parties with different you know, incentives and um, coming together to do something productive. But I mean, what we're doing with, with TFL and Bosch, just to bring it back to this case study, is trialing a way of those parties coming together to develop something together for London. And they will all have their own things they're getting out of it. But at the end of the day, it's creating a solution which everyone can benefit from. And um, I think more models of experimentation like that can lead to, to better results. So I just, I, we, we touched on privacy, and it kind of is, is linked as well. But Emily, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts on this, because speaking of case studies, I know there's a case in, and I might be oversimplifying, but in 2013, the recycling bins in the city of London were found to be monitoring uh, the phones of passers-by, which is obviously not a great thing. You have a huge issue as well about making sure that you don't share too much data from your for your users and being GDR compliant. Like, how much of a burden is it for a startup like yourself, or how much of it is a selling point? It's, um, to do it properly, the, the ISO 27001 compliant. I mean, it costs about twenty thousand pounds of a startup's budget to kind of get to, I mean, it's basically somebody's full-time job internally to make sure that we're compliant and we have all the boxes ticked and we're doing things and protecting our internal data, therefore can be hackable externally, um, and we're, and we're collecting externally user stages on the bikes. It's a huge burden, but it's also one that's really, really important. I think London, if you look at actually lots of mobility solutions in London, all that data was for a while and still is going you know, to China, for example, I mean, with... with, with a lot of the funding and a lot of the, the yeah. companies were based back there for the bikes and for the for Uber for all sorts. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a shame because they weren't GDPR compliant. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, perhaps lastly, then, I'll go back to, to you, Lauren, and um, I think I mentioned this, um, this research you've done. So back in 2016, you used Wi-Fi data to map customer routes between King's Cross, St Pancras and Waterloo, and, and you found that people took about 18 different routes uh, with about 40% of customers not taking the two most popular routes. I mean, it's only two changes. For me, that's nuts. 40% of people are spending longer underground than they need to. Now, you're going to tell me I'm grossly oversimplifying, but I am a journalist, so you'll have to forgive me for doing that. Um, but I wonder if interested about that point is, I mean, how do you decide, or how does TFL decide what hardware and what software to use when it's trying to measure? Because you've got to get, you can't, one of the things you can't afford to get wrong because all this data will be wasted. So, like, what are the challenges? Just take a step back, and, I, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this from the privacy point of view as well. So, um, back in 20, 2016, we collected data from uh, 54 stations, uh, with depersonalized information from devices that were connecting um, to our Wi-Fi network, and we ran a we ran a pilot, um, and we did it for a month. And we, um, we then sort of took this data away and we analyzed it. Now, what was interesting about this pilot was is that we spent a lot of time talking about what we were doing. Um, months and months before, when we first began to think about this, we had focus groups with, with, uh, with sort of customers to talk about, talk about the type of information we'd be collecting, um, how to explain it, um, the sort of perceptions, and that sort of helped inform our approach to how we would sort of do this. And then we, um, we had signs and posters all over the tube, a lot of press uh, discussions, and I had many sort of exciting discussions with journalists um, before and after. And this was really about the transparency of what we were doing and why, and that people who didn't want to participate could sort of opt out. So how do people, if, if this is people's data, um, it is fundamental that we sort of preserve uh, the trust that our customers have in us and protect their data. And so I spent a lot of time, and, and our teams really sort of spent a lot of time making sure that we were designed designing um, analysis of sort of depersonalized information in a way that protects it. So we then uh, went away 
uh, and we took uh, took the sort of the, the pilot information, and then we sort of had uh, said, okay, how could we sort of how could we sort of expand this? Um, and so in the in the background, we were thinking about um, how do we then uh, run this, and and our plan is to start uh, collecting in July, so in just uh, a few weeks' time. And so what was interesting is, so people said, well, what did you do in all this time away? And actually, one of the things that we had to do, and it sort of goes to your question, but a little maybe a little different, is is that um, so if you want to understand patterns in the network of where, uh, where you have a, a device, um, you, know, you don't know again who the person is, but you see a, dev a, a scrambled MAC address in one location and then another location, you need to know where those locations are. So we spent a long time mapping out all of the different stations and updating all of our sort of our, our CAD drawings so that actually we could know if you see, if you have a sort of a register of a point here, a dot here, and a dot here, where that was. Um, and so a lot of this, you know, there was, it, it, there's a huge potential to get some really interesting patterns and then it's what you do with it. You give information back to customers about how crowded a train is or how crowded a platform is. Um, we use it for our, our planning and our modeling. But there's a lot of grunt work um, that you've got to get right as well. And that's where you have to be focused. And it's, you, know, you don't want wasted investment, as you, as you pointed out. So making sure that when you're going to make the investment that you have a strong, a strong case because you're going to invest in technology. But not only in that. It's the business process and the people um, sort of time to sort of, to sort of make this all work. Well, I think that's a really interesting uh, point to finish with. Uh, so thank you very much for my panelists, Emily, Lauren, and George. And lastly, if, I want to say, if you see the barrel bikes, use them. I want to get your feedback. When are, they, when are they coming out? Uh, end of this week. End of this week. They look nice, I can assure you. Interested in your feedback. And uh, it would be great to support some uh, London startups. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you to my panelists.